Good afternoon from London, and I'm uh, here with yet another talk. And we are discussing today about when all the systems, uh, the economic systems are collapsing and we are in crises in the world. So where do we go from here? And this is the purpose of what now? So we have brought you other speakers and um, thought leaders as well. And we are all exploring together what could look like the what is the future of money our economics and as you know mark is the expert on uh, economy of well-being and happiness so our today's guest i'm quite happy to introduce him um uh, especially the concept of haponomy haponomy uh, which me. i think yeah <laughs> eponymy Right? Yeah, it's, it's happy economy put together. Uh, yes, and then you get <laughs> yes. So Steph Cooper is joining us from um, from Canada. Is it? No, Belgium. from Belgium. Belgium. Oh, right. Okay. I had a lady friend just now from Belgium as well. So Steph would be um, talking. He's the expert, and he would be talking about the influence of uh, monetary systems on individual behavior and uh, society at large as well, that uh, the money creation and sustainable models of money creation and money generation as is Mark's expertise as well. So I'm going to bring in Mark, who's going to introduce and bring in Steph as well. So welcome to our talk. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Steph. It's a pleasure to have you back. I've, I think I've, we've done two podcasts already, you and I. And I was so impressed with your TEDx talk in Antwerp on the sustainable money system that you've envisioned. And, you know, it's interesting, you come out of an IT world um, of, um, yesterday we were talking about binomial systems and debits and credits and, you know, which is really the, the basis of the money system. And, but you've come up with some pretty impressive uh, ideas and I think models that could be implemented literally today or at least experimented with. And we have opportunities now in Canada, I know with uh, a new economic model, I know New Zealand's been advancing a well-being uh, model for the economy. So I wanna talk about what you see as a distinct possibility in the next, uh, actually a few months ahead as we deal with uh, the economic crisis that is going to fall out from the pandemic of COVID and um, really the future of money as you envision it. So um, I'm very pleased to have you join us today and we'll just let, let you open up with uh, what you've been thinking and envisioning with this new sustainable money system. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, well, the main thing I think that needs to happen is that um, first we we need to make sure that the people that are working in the monetary system become aware of the behavioral influences of the current system uh, in our society, because that is something that in, in any economic article that I see, um, that's missing. There's, there is no link to uh, behavioral nudges by the debt-based system that we are seeing today. There's also no link, except in the, the, the 2012 report from the Club of Rome here in Europe that describes the, the missing link between money and sustainability. Uh, Bernard Litar there uh, proposes alternative monetary system alongside the current one. But in my opinion, he did not go far enough because when you have a, a toxic element in your society, you do not say like, oh, let's keep the toxic element and just put something nice next to it. And then we'll be able to deal with the toxins. No, you, you just decide to get rid of the toxins. Look at DDT back in the 60s. Most developed countries decided like, you know what? We are just going to ban DDT and we're going to look for better pesticides. And I see the current monetary system as the DDT of our economic world, to be honest. The, the current influence is that it inherently pushes our economy to grow in output, in turnover. And I know there are papers circling that say that there is no inherent push for growth in our current monetary system. And mathematically, they are correct. Um, but the assumptions they base this on is that um, for that to work and to not have an, uh, an economic growth push from the monetary system itself, 
you, you need to have banks spend all their profits in the real economy. You should have people not hoarding money and people with a decent income that have no debt should for some reason still take out loans. Mm -hmm. Now, I think these assumptions are just not realistic. And then you can have a beautiful mathematical model that says, look, mathematically, there's no push, but there's this pesky element that's called the human being that won't play along. Can I, can I just interject there? You've said something really profound. And, you know, as an economist, I, I actually went back to the data, uh, the, the, debt, the, the debt data in the United States and the relationship of GDP. And I did find, in fact, there is a relationship between those two that the debt keeps growing. In fact, it grows exponentially through the power of compounding, which is interesting because that means the net never gets paid, paid yeah. off. So it's been growing for 60 years since World War II. Uh, but then the question is, well, what's the interest rate pay, payment on the debt? Because yeah. that yeah. is actually, you know, you can show these two graphs, GDP and debt, and you say, well, it looks like there's a relationship because GDP actually has to keep growing just to service the interest payments on the debt. So mathematically, we can say there is a push. At least yeah. there appears to be a push. And so we need to talk about this because the fact is the interest charges on every dollar of household income is very significant of at least 50 cents on the dollar or more in the United States. And there's no recognition that this is actually ridiculous and yeah. unnecessary. So I just wanted to make that point because some of the listeners might not understand yeah, how the debt GDP relationship. It, it, does, it is also because um, what, what the assumptions, if the assumptions would hold true, all the money we would keep staying in circulation and, and would be able to be used to pay off the debt. But since now people do hoard money, a, a lot of money is being pushed towards the financial markets. That, that money is no longer available to pay off the debt, which means new loans have to be taken out just in order to pay back the previous ones. But then uh, a whole lot of that money is again being pulled into the financial markets. Uh, I read a report uh, not so long ago, and I actually reread a piece of it today, that in 2011, the size of the financial assets in Europe was about, on average, 600% of, of European GDP. Wow. That's a financial market that is six times as big as your real economy. Um, now, of course, it's not all money because those are just price labels for financial products. It's not real Thank money. You. Thank you. But, it's just a price label. Yeah. yeah. But it does mean that a lot, of, a lot of money is circling around there, which is not available in the real economy to pay off debts. And another thing, and this is a, a second growth push mechanism that I recently discovered, has to do with state debt. I, I don't know the exact situation in Canada or, or the US, but here in Belgium, state debt is for the most part never paid off. Correct. So it's, it's just rolled over, which means that uh, diminishing state debt means growing your economy so that your state debt is percentage-wise small enough that it seems to shrink relative to your economy. But it can only happen if your GDP keeps on growing. And that's the second mechanism that pushes us into just striving for higher GDP numbers, which have been proven to only contribute to, um, to well-being up to a certain level. So may, may I add another uh, data reflection here? Um, yeah. After World War II, um, most countries kept a constant debt to GDP ratio. So the national debt in Canada to GDP was 150% constant okay. uh, until 1973 when the leaders, the world leaders got together in Basel, Switzerland and agreed to have a lot of that national debt offloaded to the private sector. So the private yeah. sector would buy the, the government bonds and after 1974, you see the growth in that ratio of debt to GDP now go to, in the case of both Canada and the U.S., around 360% today. Yeah. So you can see that widening gap from a very stable, constant ratio now. Yeah. But the, the thing there is because um, I've been reading other modern monetary theory uh, a bit. 
And they, they come with proposition that, propositions that within the current system make sense because the debt is just, it's just a number on a balance sheet, right? Mm -hmm. And if, if you agree with your uh, central banks, like, you know what, we're just going to roll it over indefinitely and we're not going to worry about it. And we're just going to worry about the interest that we pay on the debt and that we need to just keep it low enough so that it remains payable, all fine. But there's something that modern monetary theory does not take into account. And that is that banks extend loans only when they can make a profit on it which means that if we um, go back to, the, uh, to using water as, as, as an image, you, ha you have a source of water somewhere and you've got guards around it and your population has to go to the source and then bargain with the guards to see where they can get some water, in this case, mm -hmm. money. The funny thing within our current economic system is if you already have a large tank of water at home, then it's easier to get another bucket than when you go like, you know what, I'm, I'm totally out of water, but I'm, I'm really thirsty and my fellow family is dying of thirst and, and could we please get some water? And then the guard will say like, no. Because this, <laughs> this is what's happening with banks. If you're poor and you don't have any money, but you've got a shitload of bills to pay, then the bank says, no, we cannot extend, your money, extend the loan for that because you won't be able to pay it back. So we got guarded sources of money that are mainly available to people who, who already have a lot of it. Mm -hmm. But a large part of the population is now actually being forced into, into labor to work for, for money. And um, we're actually seeing a, a kind of class struggle again. Um, because Large companies are in, in really good positions to negotiate low wages. And, and then we, that's an, another, th another thing about the current monetary system, there's no limit to how much money you can gather. Is the only thing on the planet, nothing in the natural world can grow indefinitely, but your pile of money can. And because money inherently also brings in security with it, because if you lose it, there's no guarantee it will come back. And I've, I've experienced it myself. I mean, I, I had at one point, I had a large inheritance and I've been in the position that I had a million euros in my bank account and my stress that was created through the fear of losing it raised, it went up. Now, I'm, I'm a rational thinking and I, I can go like, oh, I feel this. <laughs> This is an emotional thing. I acknowledge the emotion, but I'm going to do something else anyway. So eventually I decided to give um, a large chunk away to my family. The rest I invested in renovating my house. And currently my reserves are zero. And then you played Warcraft for months on end, I think, didn't you? No, that was before that. That was before, oh, before that. Yeah, that was <laughs> long before the, that was actually the transition from where, um, I was totally dependent on, on labor, on, on doing a job for an income to becoming more and more independent from, from work. Um, that's when I played a lot of World of Warcraft. <laughs> We're about Sorry, can I come in here, Steph? Sure. Because um, could you, I always ask this question, and Mark and I have discussed that money does not bring happiness. Many people say that, but then there are people who say, no, this is wrong. Money does bring happiness because you have the, so we do have this emotional relationship with money and we feel it's security yeah. and not having money makes us insecure, right? Yeah. But then there are people like Mark and yourself and myself and say, oh, hey, we don't need money to live happily ever after if there is, you know, if there is enough in the house, say for now, if yeah. I take my example now, I say, okay, what now? I do have till the last grain of rice in yeah. my house, at least I could be fed. And this is what I'm worried about. So yeah. could you please say, what, what is your argument about when people say, oh no, hang on, money is important. It brings happiness because you have the ability to buy things that make yeah. you happy. Um, well, money brings happiness up to a certain point. 
There's a, actually a professor here in Belgium has done research on it and we worked together with him. And he, he, did, uh, he did questionnaires um, and asked people like, how happy are, are you according to their income? And what he figured out was that up to 4,000 euros a month, money did increase your happiness. Now, mm. the curve started to flatten the, the closer you got to 4,000. But once people earn more than 4,000 euros a month, they actually became unhappier again. Mm. And, and the reason for that was they could afford everything. And now they were trying to figure out what, what could bring meaning in their life. And if you haven't decoupled from the idea that consumption brings you happiness, then once you can consume the necessities and you, you stay in that uh, frame of mind that it is consumption of goods that will bring you happiness, then, then, you, then you start to go like, okay, but what can I buy now? And then you get these extremes like $200,000 um, nail polish bottles, <laughs> or they, they, they actually exist, which is, um, I think the most expensive cocktail in London was something around 9,000 pounds for a cocktail. Yes, yes. And then these people are not happier. They're actually unhappier than the people that, that earn like 3,000 euros a month. Because what the, the step they did not make was, was to stop and think what is really valuable in my life. Hmm. And the longest running experiment um, has shown that what we value most is not having a lot of stuff, but having meaningful relationships with people around us. Hmm. More late. So are you saying that, as Mark was also saying in another um, uh, talk, uh, he was mentioning that with universal income, are you suggesting if we give everybody, say, for example, 4,000 euros, yeah. then everybody is on the same line, everybody's happy. But would that bring meaning to their lives? Because they, are not, they haven't earned it or worked for it. So I think I, what I'm noticing the frustration I hear in people's voices is because they are working from home, but you know, that routine is gone and they feel there's this emptiness. And you know, we are, because we are creatures of habit. Yeah. So we are like, oh, we craving, oh, I'm not working. And I say, no, but you are working. I mean, I hear my daughter complaining. She's a banker as well, yeah. sitting at home. And because she's in isolation, fiddling with numbers, she's always cranky. And I can yeah. understand it. It makes you cranky once you just number number crunching. I've yeah, been yeah, there myself. Yeah. So <laughs> if you give everybody that universal income or 4,000 euros, yeah. do you think then we'll be happy people after that or what? It, it's not a given. Um, what it will do is relieve financial stress. There's a lot of economic strain in our society. P people that are working jobs that they actually hate, but they keep on doing it because it provides them with an income. Mm -hmm. what, what a universal basic income that, that is, it doesn't have to be 4,000, it can be 2,000, 3,000, you know, but it, at least a number that... Um, totally eliminates the idea that I cannot survive. Hmm. It should be enough that people can have a comfortable life. It, it doesn't have to be so high they can buy Ferraris and stuff, but um, you should take away the, um, well, the economic strain that, that, more, that a lot of people in our society are feeling today. Because what that does is it, if, if you are taking out of that, I, that feeling of scarcity, then a couple of things happen in people's behavior. There's, there's actually a really good book called Scarcity with subtitle, Why Having So Little Means So Much, where they've done excellent research on what scarcity does. And, and three things happen with, with people in scarcity. One is you get hyper-focused on the object of scarcity, whether it is money, um, 
loneliness, time, doesn't matter what it is, but you, you get a hyper focus on what is scarce. So you get tunnel vision. Mm. Long term thinking is off the table. Everything becomes short term thinking. And, and this is something that might surprise you your IQ drops with about 15 points. They did a test with uh, sugarcane farmers. Sugarcane farmers, they, del they hand in their harvest once a year. So they get their entire income for the entire year in one go. So they did IQ tests with the same farmers, the exact same people, a couple of weeks before and a couple of weeks after they had received their yearly income. And with the same people that had an IQ difference of 15 points. So scarcity makes us, uh, gives us tunnel vision, makes us short-sighted, and it may actually makes us stupid. I've, this is a, hyp a hypothesis, but I think political leaders, when they work from a mind frame that their governmental budget is scarce, hmm. will probably have the same effect on them. So the fact that they are, that they have tunnel vision, that they just see the numbers, that they lack long-term vision and that they sometimes seem stupid is not it really already seems stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No. That, 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 this is really important reflection we had with our last guest, which is, you know, uh, poverty, my understanding, having worked in the poverty policy area, is I think a stress from the lack of resources or lack of money yeah. to meet your basic needs. So you're you're operating from a reptilian brain, you know, uh, survival mode. And I, I do agree, it actually reduces our IQ and all the other things and, and our hope and all those other subjective things. Um, so I think it is possible to create, in fact, we had a universal basic income experiment in Canada in 19, I think it was 1977 or 76, so in a place, yeah. in a little town in Manitoba. Yeah, I and read they, about it. It was an incredible experiment. They provided a living wage kind of uplift on, on people who are, let's say, below that, four, let's say this $4,000 number, right? Yeah. Uh, it turns out the average income of Canadians now is about 48,000 a year or 4,000, right, a month. Um, so they did this uplift from, say, a minimum wage to a living wage. So they maybe went from $10 to $15. So they paid that extra. And the people, and then they studied the, the, the perceptions and behavior of the, those beneficiaries. And they yeah. found that they were more hopeful about their future. Their children were better. Like there was all these other indices of improved well-being that you could say well clearly uh, that little uplift to have just enough income for basic needs for a reasonably yeah. good life was not only su sufficient to uh, result in a measurable i would call it well-being return on investment yeah that yeah. it was almost a no-brainer and then it was canceled the program was canceled so here you know way back when we had an experiment like that so what you're saying is we could again attempt such an experiment. Um, I've said the associate finance minister, if we knew how many people were not earning 4,000 euros or $4,000 a month individually, I think it should even be less. If you strip out interest out of the yeah. equation of the economy, you're down to $2,000 Yeah, or something like that. So in your model, now you've described an interesting model where there's always a sustainable amount of money, and we've talked about this. So imagine we, the, the central bank, um, in concert with the other banks, because I think they're not getting rid of the banks because they provide important financial literacy and can you know, check out your business plan. Are you yeah. thinking clearly about your enterprise? All of us need that for sure. But a, a sustainable money supply that always sufficient and always regularly calibrate as if you have a watershed it's always releasing just enough liquidity you know or flow uh, to oxygenate the economy and all the assets that have potential so can you describe your system because i think that the idea of sort of a bucket where all of us have we always have just you know i have just one cup and it's always it's always you know close to every morning i wake up i have one cup of water and it's just enough for me for the day. Yeah. And the next day is a new day. 
can you describe that that metaphor and what you're seeing also in the experiments you're doing with people when they when they play your sustainable money game? Yeah, sure. I'll 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 use the metaphor of water again. Like so, in the current system, we have the guarded well where you have to kind of go and hope that you can come home with a bucket. And with, with the sustainable money system, you're attached to the water net. You actually have a tab at home that's always open. And there's a constant flow of money coming out. But you only have a limited um, amount of storage space. Well, you, well, not completely, because a, a lot of people think like, oh, I, not, now I cannot be rich anymore. There's still a possibility to be, to be rich in the sustainable money system. There's, there will still be inequality, but it will be fair inequality. The, because, and, and the, uh, my colleague Bruno Delapier has done research on that too. People do not want to be equal. Look at the communist system uh, from uh, the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. That was based on equality. Every, everyone, no matter what they did, got the same wage. That didn't work either. People were mm -hmm. not happy. You, you have to give people a possibility that if they work harder, they, they could earn more. And then we can have an entire discussion about uh, meaningful work and working for money and, and all that, but um, that, that would be a podcast on its own, I think. But, but uh, just, just to interject for a second, you're, this is the biggest conundrum in economics is the distribution, right? So you're saying, yeah. it's okay, you can be a Bill Gates, you can work 10,000 hours and design the best software in the world. Yeah. But some, somehow the system has to find a way of distribution as nature yeah. does. Yeah. Well, it's also in our current system, if someone is really rich and has a lot of money in his bank account, since all money is backed by debt, someone has to carry that debt. So you can only be rich if someone loses out. Yes. Yeah, the, the positive <laughs> thing about the sustainable money system is if you have a whole lot of money in your bank account, no one suffers because of it. Because everyone will still be connected to the, to the constant tap at home. And you, you can see that the tap actually goes into a reservoir and the reservoir has holes in it. Starting from a certain point, there's a hole in it and then a little bit higher, there's a slightly bigger hole and then it's a bigger hole. And, and, and the hole becomes bigger and bigger the, the more water you put into it. So the more you, you, wanna, you wanna hold on to, the more water will start flowing out. So your inflow has to compensate for that. So you get a diminishing return on, on income, which, and this is an assumption that I'm making, we, we'll at one point, make people stop and think and you're like why am i doing this because <laughs> you know i i can work harder so that i i can earn more and more money and then i reach the next bigger hole and more and i will have to work even harder to well, what is was it what is it for hmm. <laughs> could i just come in here because something very interesting you've said uh from an um I, I read about this Islamic philosopher and he's written about wisdom in cooperation. So yeah. it's basically about reciprocity. And he's written that in any society, yes, God has made us equal, but there is still a hierarchy. Some people are more intelligent, some are not. I mean, you can train, there are laborers, you know, there are plumbers or whoever. This is their job as well. So with reciprocity and if we understand the wisdom in cooperation that some of us would have to carry that burden of those who are below us or are not equally smarter and not everybody could be that clever or smarter so i yeah. just love the fact how he's written it that it's always about reciprocity that those who can should carry those who can't um, be. And there's well, never going to be equality anywhere in this world. We understand this, right? Yeah. But as long as the inequality is fair, yeah. then people don't mind. People do not mind that someone else is, earns more money than them. Yeah. But if, if, uh, if you work at a company and your boss earns a thousand times more than you do, and you work eight hours a day, five days a week, then then that's not going to be conceived as fair mm -hmm. yeah so if if we 
and again, it, a lot of it has to do with how people see human nature. Current economic thinking has this idea that people are selfish, lazy, and they need extrinsic motivation to do, no, to do something. What the current crisis is showing us is that is not true because mm -hmm. we see a, a lot of people reaching out to each other and say like, can I help you? Not for the money, but just because it gives meaning to their lives to help out fellow human beings. Yeah, I saw the, in news the other day that there was this, um, they were interviewing people who are being affected and this guy uh, has a wine tasting um, restaurant or something. Yeah. And he said that he's out of job at the moment and he was worried. So somebody was listening. To, so this guy then sent him a message. He actually sent the message to the news, news reader yeah. that can I approach this guy? So they connected them. And that guy offered, he asked him, how much do you want to survive just to survive? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Forget about your business. And he said, 5,000 would be enough for now, 5,000 pounds. So this guy said, take 5,000. And he, he was asking, why are you giving me this money? Yeah. He said, I don't want anything from it, not like interest or anything. Just take this money for now. Yeah. So, you know, there are instances that are happening that people can, are capable of doing that. Yeah. Sure. It, it actually is good for our own happiness. If if we if we can give, it makes our it makes us happier. We we did not become the dominating species on this planet by being individually competitive. And, we and we learn, and we learn from nature. I mean, indigenous people learn from nature as the model of reciprocity. Yeah. Hmm. There's a there's an interesting um, biological. Uh, tidbit of knowledge, we are the only species of apes that needs to move in order to survive. We literally die if we sit on our butt all day. Well, anyway, our chances of dying significantly increase if we, if we don't move. You Chimpanzee see, that's my worry with universal income, that if there is no meaning, you know, me, we are the creatures of meaning making. We always make meaning yeah. of something. If there's no meaning for me to do something, do something, be engaged in something, then, you know, I'm brain dead, basically. Yeah. But the I thing, think, Anika, that's, I just want to build on, I think that's a really yeah. important reflection and stuff you're talking about, you know, in working with Indigenous people, they would say, they would have words like, they're, you know, there's no central chief. There's many chiefs. Yeah. Uh, there's many skills needed in a community, in a village. You know, you might be a great basket weaver or a great uh, caribou hunter. Yeah. Uh, you know, you make good baskets or whatever. So all of us self-identify a gift or a skill that contributes to the collective good. Yeah. Now, yeah. in a society right now, you're, you're, a lot of us are motivated just to work to pay the debts or you know, we, we don't even know why we're here. We just, you know, I'm going to be an accountant, but I hate accounting because it yeah. doesn't bring me any joy. I'd rather play my slide guitar every day. But, you know, so yeah. what would be interesting is an economy where we are actually self-identifying our, our skill and our mastery. Uh -huh. Yeah. And we have the water, your, your tap is coming in. As an economist, I know exactly what those holes are. I know that you're spending so much on, on rent or housing. Yeah utilities, on food, on clothing, um, whether some of those holes are really meaningful to your happiness or not. Well, know, but, the, the, the but that would be interesting. So you, so you have an economy where we're individually self-identifying our skill and our desire for mastery and, and the liquidity is sufficient so that yeah. we can develop that skill. So it's not about universal basic income sitting on the couch. It's no. about work brings us meanings as does relationship etc i just want to say that the, the metaphor with the holes the, the holes is not your expenses okay the uh, your expenses you just you, you just take a cup and you you take some water from from your container and you pour it in so on. that's your expenses the holes oh, are actually um because if you create new money all the time then you will get inflation yes 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 um, but what the holes do is they actually take water out of the system. So they make sure that once the system gets saturated, 
when your inflow of water equals your outflow through the holes, at that point, your monitoring mass in your system, the total amount of water in, in your system stabilizes. And it fluctuates a little bit depending on how much water is, is sitting in which container. But the total amount, and this is, this is something that central banks have been trying to do forever. Mm. How can we control the supply of money? This system yeah. does it all by itself. Right, right. This is how nature works. I mean, we yeah. evapotranspiration and the you look yeah. at the water cycle, there's never, you know, you could say there's actually never any loss of water. People say, well, no water is being, no, I don't, I don't believe it. It's going somewhere. It's yeah. being dispersed somewhere, but it's coming back in the form of rain. And yeah. so it's constantly get, getting uh, recycled and in a kind of homeostatic uh, yeah. system. Hmm. So could I, could I share a reflection here, yeah. which is that we know that people are not uh, economically literate or financially literate as well. So then maybe some people are drinking more water than they, they require, <laughs> they, and then, then they there's this imbalance. So, you know, economists and governments, they've been trying. It's been, you know, you know like a vicious circle. They've been trying forever. Yeah. Do you think if we bring in the common man and woman and they are somehow made, um, as Mark keeps on saying, if they are made aware how money is generated or created and how should we spend it with your expertise on yeah. behavioral, you know, our attachment with money, do you think that would solve any problem? It's not about knowing how the money works. I mean, mm. you don't need to know how your car engine works to drive your car. <laughs> That's true. You just yeah. need to learn how to drive the car. Yeah. And um, of course, if, if people, you know, if people want to learn about money and how it works, and that's all fine. But we don't need, we don't all need to know everything. Um, I, I don't need to know uh, the ins and outs of physics, of chemistry, um, just so that, that I can, I, I, don't, I don't need to know the details of farming to, to have food. Oh. That's, that's the great thing about human beings, we collaborate. We have experts in certain fields, we have some generalists, and we, we put them together and we make something that is bigger than the sum of the parts. Our collective intelligence is huge. Mm -hmm. It is this scarcity system that actually holds back people's creativity. It hold, mm -hmm. holds back people's quest for meaning. Because you, you mentioned earlier, like, yeah, but if I have, um, would there not be a danger that if people have uh, a guaranteed income that they would just not have any meaning in their life anymore. For a while, maybe. Mm -hmm. Because we also mm -hmm. need to allow people to go through a transition period. Huh. Most people that have a job have been from school, have been trained to be told by others what to do. Yes. So our self-advocacy has been has been dimmed and and i've like i said okay i'm, I'm just one case um and scientifically that's that's not proof but anyway when i came out of it i remember in the beginning the the, the first couple of months that i woke up in the morning and know and and i was self-employed i was still working on a an it project back then and i woke up in the morning and there was no one to tell me what to do <laughs> and I felt lost. Truly, I was like, now what? So, so yeah, I'll, well, you know, I'll, I'll well, I'll, uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll just go and have fun. I'll, I'll do, uh, and, and I was, I was <laughs> kind of wondering and then it's like, uh, for a long time, I did not know what to do with my life. Yeah. Today, there is still no one telling me what to do, but I get up in the morning and I know what I want to do. Yeah. I've, I've I found agree with my that. own meaning, but, but this, is, this is something we will need to guide people mm. towards that place. And that's where I see uh, a lot of work for psychologists, coaches, and, and mm. not because people are stupid, not because people no. are less, mm. not, not because people are not capable, but because people have been trained for so long yeah. It's the that conditioning. Someone yeah. that tells you what you should do. 
mm. and shut up and listen. Yeah. But you haven't answered my question. What about those people who might drink a lot of water? What do we do with that? I mean, well, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> remains an issue. <laughs> as, Mark, as Mark mentioned, banks will still play a role. A totally different, well, not a completely different role, but what, what will shift for banks is banks will no longer be the creators of money mm -hmm. because that is done by the system. And it's ideally a distributed system where there is no concentration of power because if you manage to implement it in such a way that there is no concentration of power, then there will be no abuse. Then no one will be able to take over the system because as soon as you have concentration of power, the yes. risk for corruption is there. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. So I think this is why power. real management we've yeah. been exploring. Up, Give the know? system in the hands of everyone. Maybe you can just, this is something that we're, we're still uh, looking into whether we can fix our parameters of the system and mm -hmm. just, then just have it run indefinitely with those parameters. We haven't figured it out yet, but that, that's an experiment we, we can do. Yes, um, and I see we are in this phase of transition as well, yeah. where, where people are now exploring their relationship with money. So, you know, we could be just going through this phase. And this is what I, after so many interviews and talks we have done, this is what I keep on thinking again. That yes, maybe there is something new emerging that we are all collectively thinking. Yes, about. but it is our relationship with what kind of money. Mm -hmm. Because the type of money changes the relationship with that money. It's, mm -hmm. it's like your relationship with your couch. If it's a really nice and comfy couch, you're gonna have a totally different relationship than when it's a couch that's really hot and lumpy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the nature of the money will change our relationship towards it. Right. And this is, this is something that we've uh, discovered in, in the simulations we've done with games. So we have two different games where you can play the game with the current system and with the sustainable money system. One is a, a short, simple card game you can play twice in about an hour, but even within that hour, we, we see a behavioral shift in the participants. With the sustainable money system, people report they are less stressed, they can take better care of themselves, they uh, care for others more, they collaborate better, and there is more attention to a common goal. With the board game, which is more complex, but also more complete, because there you actually take in um, pollution and air quality and, and, and things like that. We, we did a test play once and, and this was a group of people and they were all into, you know, um, green economy and, and we should make sure that we reduce our carbon footprint and that every, everything is circular. They played the game with the current monetary system and they polluted the shit out of it. And after the game, they were appalled by the, their own behavior. <laughs> oh, I mean, these, are, these are people that are consciously working on a circular, sustainable economy. And they're like, oh, gosh. they should not have survived the game. That's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> and you do this, the exact same game with the sustainable money system. And you see that all of a sudden pollution is not a problem anymore because people take care of it. Mark, parting words, maybe your reflections from you. Well, I, Steph, I know you and I have, you know, getting back to the pragmatic, um, you know, if we got a call yeah. from the European Central Bankers or European Parliament, or as I did with, uh, from the Associate Finance Minister, um, what would you, what would you, and I think your point is very important, that this transition isn't going to be overnight. Yeah. I mean, right now, uh, unemployed Canadians can get two thousand dollars injected straight into the bank account yeah. it's almost like a public utility you know two thousand at the beginning of the month is your allocation of water and your cistern and that should hopefully hold you over to the next month so we're already yeah. experiencing that some of us are saying why would it go back to the job i had before when i can yeah. just i don't know how long it'll last but let's say it lasts for six months now within 60 days my brain is already rewired yeah. I'm thinking, okay, 2000 is probably just enough to buy groceries and yeah. pay the rent. 
and oh, guess what? I get to learn how to make bread and wine, and I, I get to, uh, you know, I can't hug my neighbor yet, but yeah. you know, eventually that also will come back. And suddenly, our whole, our mental uh, synapses are are re, are changed because yeah. we've like your game. We've already experienced. Wow, if there's no scarcity anymore, yeah, and if there's just enough, but there's still an incentive. Like you, I've experienced that many years ago when I, you know, started my own consulting, yeah. and it was it was a difficult transition because I had a government job, I had a guaranteed income, right? Yeah. I just had to show up at nine o'clock and work till five and right, get my job description done, and you know, and uh, magically money appeared in my account. Yeah. Um, when you're your own boss, you you got to go. Wow, I you know. I could say I have enough money. I could I could go golfing for the rest of my life. Yeah. But you know what? I'm incentivized to contribute something to the world because I have all this time. Yeah. Which is uh, that, that, that's it's, also what's, what's ironic is you can hear that our water tap running upstairs. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, uh. But so the the question is, as we, you know, in all seriousness, you know, here I'm in the place of advising the minister of finance to say. And, and they recognize what, what the bureaucrats are recognizing is we don't actually know what to do next. Like we are, we're stressed because if we make the wrong, if we make the wrong policy decision, yeah, uh, then we'll get criticized. So it's almost like there's a paralysis or, but then in this moment, there's this opportunity to go, all right, let's on a spreadsheet, you and I, we talked about this, we could experiment with Canada as an entity and say, Maybe it's two thousand a month, um, yeah. but we can do that through the central bank properly, you know, as a sovereign central bank. And we allow the private banks to exist. We maybe write off the debts that have accumulated. That's a lot of debt. That's five, you know, seventy-five trillion in the U.S. It's not going to go over away overnight, but over time we will transition. Yeah. And anyways, I'm I guess I'm speaking out loud. I'm telling you what what I think I would do. But what would you? What would you do? Well, I think uh, a closing reflection. There are there are two possibilities. Either you evolve the current system into the sustainable money system, which is possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, banks already pay a negative interest to the, to the European Central Bank, and I yep. think uh, in, in Canada and the US it might we're, be the same. We're close. Support. We're close. We're into negative oil prices. Like we got. Yeah, like, I've, I've been following that. It was like hilarious. We're we're like in a world of demurrage. Yeah. Yeah. Being negative, you know, interest yeah. rates. So, so, so anyway, you could you could say like helicopter money is a concept that already exists, which is your guaranteed income. You can you can, so it is is just a policy. The all the instruments are there. You can say okay, well, as of yeah. today, we start issuing permanent helicopter money, and. I don't know how it is in, in Canada and the US, but here in Europe, banks have been calling for negative interest and savings. Mm -hmm. So you could do that too. You could say like, you know, our interest rates will be negative as soon as you have, I don't know, 50,000, 100,000 uh, euros or dollars or whatnot on your account. From then on, interest rates will be negative. And the more you have, the more negative the interest rates will be. And that money, we're just gonna destroy it. We're gonna abolish, um, money creation from debt. That's mm -hmm. a policy decision. Yes. Um, the, you, you, could, you could decide that the debt that is still there today remains, but you could also say we were just going to write it off. We'll have a, a it, large worldwide jubilee. It was a fictional all, entry in a book, yeah. a bookkeeping system anyways, right? Yeah. So we'll just do a is, jubilee. Yeah. yeah, all debt is canceled. Uh, from now on, we're, we're working with helicopter money, negative interest rates. The money that's collected from those negative interest rates is um, destroyed. Banks actually become a project for the common good because their job now is to help people stay financially sane within the new system. Um, within the sustainable money system, that, that, that's a, an extra module that can be implemented. It's not part of the core structure, but it's something you could say that the, the demurrage actually flows to your projects for common good. And then if they ha do not have enough money, they can actually print the money they need while well, printing virtually, of course, because it's an electronic monetary system. 
But if they get, if they receive more money through Demerge than they need, then the money is taken out of the system. So that way, and your projects for the common good are decided upon by your population. So you shift towards a very democratic system. You democratize money along the way. And what your governance is doing at that point is making sure that those projects for the common good are implemented in, in a very qualitative, qualitative way. And what I would also like to add, and this is a bit more the philosophical point, because people always go like, yeah, but then you, you give people a basic income and they haven't done anything for it. Well, you could actually look at it, you, you give people life energy within an economic framework. We have, long time ago, we have had uh, civilizations, um, we, had, we had humanity without money. And what we, we just, as, as you said, Anika, those who, who contribute, contribute according to, to their ability and their contributions go to the people that consume according to their needs. That's actually the, the basic definition of communism as it was originally. It's described in uh, the Grand Grand book. Grand yeah. yeah. So if you look at a guaranteed income as life energy within the economic system, so you have um, something, you, you actually get air so you can breathe, so you can uh, grow, you can, um, I'm looking for the word you can invest in your personal development so you can contribute better to society because we all want to contribute. We all want meaning in our lives. People or to our families not, as well. What? I said not just society, to even your families, like certainly. Well, now that's part of, of, yeah. it's part of society. Even a, yes. even a small group, it's all part of society. It just scales. Hmm. And we all want to contribute. And And those people who do not want to contribute, uh, well, actually, it's such a small minority. And what I think is they probably are probably suffering from some kind of trauma that blocks their feeling of, I want to contribute. Um, so we inadequacy. It could be inadequacy within yourself yeah. when you feel that. Yeah. And, and we need to look at that. And say like, you know what? We'll help you. You you don't have to yes. contribute. We yes. we will contribute to your life so that you become a happier person. And once someone really becomes happy, and what it it it's, it all has to do also with self love. We can only yeah. love others if we manage to love ourselves. Definitely. I think, uh, uh, Steph, this is a beautiful, uh, you know, end of our reflection. Uh, and I know that um, Stefano Zamania, who's one of the brilliant economists, I'm going to cut it off, but said, you know, every person, no matter whether you're, you're a catatonic or bipolar, has something to contribute uh, to the well-being of society. Everybody, even a yeah. bipolar person who in their yeah. manic state is so efficient mm -hmm. and, then, and then six months they're on the couch. Mm. But over the year, they've got that, that sustainable bucket of inflowing liquidity so they can be the best they can be under their circumstances. So I wanna thank you for, uh, this was really inspirational. I know there's a lot more work to be done. Um, and I know you and I will keep playing this out maybe on spreadsheets. So uh, yeah. Anika will keep philosophizing and, and uh, <laughs> being the joy Somebody has to do that job as well, right? <laughs> <laughs> be showing us thank you, nice Steph. Time. Very nice meeting you as well. Thank, thank you. you. Bye now.